This is the matte paper from November 2020. Um, I'm only going to do section number one in this video, which is the first 10 multiple choice questions, which are worth 40 out of the 100 marks in this paper. Um, these are the grade boundaries for this paper. Um, I say grade, grade boundaries. This is the average number of marks an entrant got. This is the average number of marks people invited to interview got. And this is the average number of marks people uh, who got offers got. So those are the numbers you're kind of aiming for. Though these numbers are much higher than any other map paper that I've seen. So either this was a slightly easier paper or just a very talented group of entrants who happened to take this, but the numbers are not usually this high. But as I said, I'm only gonna be doing section one, which is just four, which is just 10 multiple choice questions, all worth four marks. Working is not marked, just the answer. Um, so it's four marks or nothing. So you do need to be very careful when you answer these questions. Um, the, the very logical thing to do in this first one is do a sketch. Of course, the, the center um, makes a, kind of a, a line through each corner, each opposite corner. So if I just say, well, draw a square around here, this distance here is, is two across, one down. So another two across, one down gets you to five, three. And then it's possible to be super lazy and just say, okay, well, this point is five across, therefore so is this one. And this is five up, therefore so is this one. So this is five, five, and that's one of the answers. But then you notice if you do the same thing for this point and just say, well, it's three up, so it's still going to be three up here and one across. So this is one, three. That's also one of the answers. And it can't be both. It can only be one answer here. So what's gone wrong here? Well, of course, this distance here is four and this distance is two, and that's not a square. So you can't be this lazy. Just be careful of doing sketches on blank white paper, because sometimes it's very possible to um, get massively, massively misinterpret and misdraw the question. So just be a bit more careful. What you actually need to do is say, well, from the from the vertex or the corner of the square to the center, you need to go um, one down, two across, right? And what you need to do to get down to this corner, wherever it is, is just rotate this movement 90 degrees. So it will be two down, one across and that will get you to the right point, which is two, two. Or likewise, you could rotate it 90 degrees this way and go two up, one across, and that would also get your point. It just wouldn't get you one that's listed here. So this will be the answer here of two, two. Um, okay, so here we need to expand the brackets, of course. E to the X times E to the X is E to the X squared. But then of course, brackets and indices multiply, so it's just gonna be E to the two X. Middle terms cancel, and then we get a minus X squared. I'm, I'm gonna trust that you just know how to do this because um, it's really not that hard from there. Just be just just be super careful. You need to be very good at fractions because it's non-calc. Um, just be careful when you put zero into here. You don't just automatically get zero because there are x's. Each the zero is one, so you do end up with something here. Um, but yeah, then you just put it together to make it look like the answer. Um, good. This is a lovely question. Shout out to Jay Winfield, who some of you may know, um, for sending me what I think is the best solution to this problem. There are hundreds of ways to do it. But what, what we think is the prettiest solution is to notice these are all square numbers, obviously. And then if you group them like this, you've got a load of difference of squares. So one squared minus two squared, three squared minus four squared, and so on. So let's just factorize all those with our difference of two squares formula, um, or dots. And now all of the leading brackets, I've put minus in front every time. That's all minus one. It's minus one every single time. One minus two, three minus four, five minus six, and so on. So it's just minus one times this plus minus one times that, and so on. So just minus all of these. But of course, if you just expand out the brackets now, you get minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, minus six. Um, you can factorize out a minus one, and now we're just looking for the sum of the first hundred integers. Um, and hopefully you know, to sum the first, uh, to sum consecutive integers starting at one, you can just use the formula n times n plus one over two. I'll link a video in, in the description if you haven't seen that before. But the sum of the first n integers is just n times n plus one divided by two. Of course, this is very easy to work out and we get our answer from there. Uh, D. So as soon as you see this, um, you need to make sure it's in one trig um, function, not two. So change the cos for a one minus sine squared. Um, the cos squared for a one minus sine squared. Expand this out. And, uh, and what I decided to do was it's looking for the largest value. So this is a quadratic. Um, so you could, if you wanted to, write it as minus 3y squared plus 2y plus 4. Um, I didn't bother. I just took out the minus because I know it's going to be easier for me to think about completing the square if this value is positive, just because we like to have the square bit positive, don't we? Then I decided to factorize out minus 3 again because completing the square on something that's just got a 1 as the leading term of the squared thing is much easier. So, okay, taking out the minus and taking out the three, now I can complete the square on this. So we're just gonna take the object that squares, take away half of this, so that's gonna be minus a third, and then all squared. Then we take away a third, all squared, which will make a ninth, and if we tidy up this, we'll get that. 
Um, and then if we expand out to minus 3 again, we'll get this. Um, of course, two minuses make a plus, and we end up with this. Now, what's the largest value achieved by this? Well, notice how something squared is always positive. And that's always being multiplied by this negative. So this is either, unless this thing is 0, which would square to make 0, this thing is always going to be negative which of course makes the whole thing smaller. So my aim here will be to make this thing zero, in which case this will be the biggest thing possible, which is just 13 over three, which is one of the answers. Um, so yeah, just some quick explanation of why you need this. And of course it happens when sine of X is a third, but they weren't asking that, so we don't need to work that out. Good, uh, a line is tangent to this. Uh, as soon as we see this word, we differentiate this at this point. So we substitute the X value in to get that the gradient is two A. Um, and so the tangent, which is a line, is y equals mx plus c. It's y equals 2ax plus c. But it goes through this point here, so I can work out the c by substituting those two points in. Um, and I'll get c as minus a squared. So this is the line here. You can do y1 minus y minus y1 equals mx minus x1 if you'd prefer. Um, the area rebounded by the parabola, which is, of course, x squared. So this is, get a drawing out, that's x squared. This line is tangent, say, at this point, which we know is a, a squared. Um, and it, we're looking for the area bounded by the parabola, the line, and the x-axis. So we're looking for this little area on here. So now we just need to form a plan. Um, and my plan will be um, to integrate the curve between 0 and a. That will give me all of this area, all of that, if I integrate between 0 and a, the curve. And then if I just take away, I could integrate the line, but it's just a line. So if I just take away this triangle, going straight down, straight across to here, then I'll get this little area in here. So what is this triangle then? Well, its height is just a squared, clearly. Um, and I just need to work out this point. Of course, that happens when y is zero. So when y is zero here, let's solve for x. It's a over two. So this point here is at a over two, zero. Um, this point going, the, the height of this triangle is a squared, as I said, because it's just there. And of course, all the way across here is just a. So if this distance here is a over two, and all of this is a, then this little distance I'm looking for here is also a over two because a over 2 plus a over 2 is a, and now I have a half times this times that is going to be the area of the triangle, um, and of course I can work this out very easily, and I'll get this answer here eventually. Good. Uh, F, quite a nice question this. Um, what you need to think about is you could start immediately by saying, well, this is using log laws, this is log to base 10 of 10, plus log to base 10 of 9, plus log to base 10 of 8, and so on. I don't think it's the easiest thing to do. What I'm going to do instead is, is I'm going to write out all the numbers in here that are in between this and this, and then I'm going to write them all as prime factorizations and collect everything together. So 10 is 2 times 5. 9 is 3 squared. Um, that there should be a uh, this should be a squared. Sorry, there should be 3 squared. Is 9, not 3 cubed. 8 is 2 cubed. That's probably why I wrote a cubed here by mistake. And then I'll do the same thing all the way down for 2 times 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count how many 1s, 2s, 5s, and 7s are in here. So how many 2s? Well, there's 1 here. There's 2 here, because that's 2 squared. 1 there, 3 there, and 1 there. So that's going to be 8 2s in total. How many 3s? Well, again, there are 2 here, not 3. This is a mistake. There are 2 here, 1 here, because it's 2 times 3, and 1 there. So that's 4 in total. How many 5s? Well, there's just 1, 2 of them. And how many 7s? Just 1 of them. So this is the entire um, factorization of this in terms of primes. Now what I'm going to do is break these up using log laws into log of this plus log of this plus log of that and so on. And now I can use power law to bring that down like this. Now, unfortunately, none of these are the answer. Notice how the answer all has constants in it. And how do we get constants? Well, we do log to base 10 of 10. That's going to give us one. Or log to base 10 of 100. That would give us two. So how am I going to get that? Well, what happens if I break this log to base 10 of two into six of them plus two of them? Because there's currently eight of them, right? So let's break that into six of them plus two of them. And more than that, I'm going to put the two of them over here and factorize out this two from this one as well. So just make sure you follow what I've done from here to here. Split that up into eight of them plus two of them. Sorry, into six of them plus two of them. Put the six over here, that's fine. And then the two of them are going in here with this bracket here. And that makes this thing, though, this thing here is just uh, using the log law that we did here, but the other way around, um, this is going to be... 2 times 5, which is log to base 10 of 10, which is 1. So that gives me the 2 that I was looking for here. Um, I also have a log to base 10, 7, so I actually know immediately that it's either this one or this one. And it's actually possible from here to work it out, because if you look at this one here, this is, I've got this, look look at my answer currently, I've got the 2, I've got the, um, I've got the 6 log to base 10 of 2, that's matching as well. I've got the 4 log to base 10 of 6, but I've got 4 log to base 10 of 3, and those clearly aren't the same, but this matches. So 
this can't be the answer because everything matches except this and this, which are clearly different to each other. So this doesn't equal this. So it's possible to logically say that the answer is that straight away. Um, it's not this because it's missing log 10 base 7. It's not this because this has 1s rather than 2s, which is what we need. However, you can prove it by doing the same thing. Let's split this up into 2 lots of it plus 4 lots of it. Again, factorize it to 4. 2 times 3 is 6, and we'll get the answer that I underlined up here. Um, okay, so G. Cubic has that and turning points this. We, we see turning points, we differentiate, right? So dy by dx is this. Now, its turning points happen when dy by dx is 0. But you know the turning points happen at 1 and 3. So the solutions to this equation, whatever a and b are, are 1 and 3, which means if I were to factorize this to solve it, it would factorize into x minus 1, x minus 3 or the other way around. But of course, you're thinking, sitting there thinking, well, it doesn't factorize that, because where's the 3x squared come from? Well, I can fix that, right? There it is. So now this expands out to 3x squared, and, and the rest of it expands out to, um, well, you get minus 4x in here, times 3 is minus 12x. So this must be minus 12x, which makes a minus 6. And this bit expands to plus 3 times 3 is plus 9, so b must be 9. Um, so, okay, I can fill those into the original equation way right back to the original one. Um, and I can say this curve here goes through 1, 2. So I can work out C just by plugging in those numbers. So that's my entire graph now. And of course, this goes through 3D. So I'll plug in 3D and I'll be able to solve for D, which is my answer. I think this was the difficult bit about the question. But as soon as you have that realization, there were other things you could have done, but I think this is the most efficient way. Um, H is a really nice question. I like distinguishing between graphs. I think there's actually another one of these to go as well. Um, so you've got five graphs here, um, you've got three functions, f, g, and h, and then you've got two derivatives, the derivative of f and the derivative of g. So what you think here is that there are two pairs, right? There's the f and the dfx, so there's f and its derivative, and there's g and its derivative, and then h is kind of the odd one out, which doesn't have a derivative or an integral somewhere else in the picture. Um, so which one is the odd one out? Well. He doesn't ever specifically say that these are cubics and quartics and polynomials, but they look a bit like it. This one looks like a quartic because it bounces three times. These three all look like cubics, and this looks like a quadratic. So I'm going to run with this idea and say, okay, well, quartics differentiate into cubics. So this one differentiates to one of these three things. Cubics differentiate to quadratics. And actually, that tells me which one, or that eliminates a couple of these from being the odd one out immediately. For example, this can't be the odd one out because... Um, if it was, that means that these four would have to pair up with being one a derivative and one its, or one its function, one its derivative, one its function, one its derivative, but cubics don't differentiate to cubics, so this can't be the other one out. One of these cubics must differentiate to this quadratic, which makes that one of these two things, and one of these cubics must have been differentiated from this quartic, which would again make one of these, one of these two things. So the odd one out is one of these. Um, so which one is it? Well, what you notice is this one is a negative court. Is, is, is this one has turning points, firstly. There's two things you have to notice. It has turning points just, at, uh, just before minus 2 at 0 and just before 2, which means if you differentiate that, again, remember, when you differentiate a function, its roots, when you differentiate it, um, it's going to be 0 at the turning points. So this function is going to have roots at just before minus 2, 0, and just before 2. And that's actually one of these two functions, just before minus 2, 0, and, and 2. So these two have roots where this one has turning points. So this one is going to derive into one of these two things. Which one is it? Well, look at this. This is a negative quartic, right? Because it's down here and down here. So that has a negative x to the 4 term, which differentiates to a negative x cubed term, which gives you a negative cubic, which is this one here. So those two graphs match up. Um, now, of course, all we have to figure out now is which one of these cubics becomes this graph. Well, this is a positive quadratic, right? So it needs to derive, or you needed to derive a positive cubic. This is a positive cubic. So those two must be rolled up, and that's the odd one out there, um, D. Good. Uh, I is quite an interesting question. There's a couple of gorgeous ways of doing this, um, I think. Uh, or is there? Maybe maybe the only way. Um, this is actually, think, come to think of it, I made this a while ago. This was the question that I got wrong, if I remember correctly. I... I I missed a trick at the very end, so this is quite a tough question. Um, you're adding up this thing. Now, first thing to notice is that the scale factor from one term to the next, or the ratio, is, is 1 over 10x, right? Um, so when we're adding up an infinite number of these terms, the formula is a over 1 um, minus r. 
but a is 1 over tan x and r is also 1 over tan x. Now the thing that you have to notice that I missed is that for this to work r of course has to be between minus 1 and 1 otherwise you can't sum to infinity. So let's just bear that in mind at some point later. Okay so let's plug these numbers in so a is, is, is this and r is this and that apparently we need to equal tan x. So that's just taking this equaling tan x and plugging these two things in. Now um, you can try and sort this out. You can sort out this bottom bit by saying that's tan x over tan x. So this is tan x minus 1 all over tan x. Um, and then you can... I, I did this deliberately just to teach double fractions. But when you have a fraction over a fraction, this becomes a denominator and this becomes a numerator. So you end up with tan x over tan times this. But of course, um, those tans cancel and left with this. If you prefer doing that in a different way, please do. There are probably easier ways. I also made a note here that tan x can't be 0 because then you're dividing by 0. But it also can't be tan x minus 1 because then you're dividing by 0. As, it also can't be 1 because then 1 minus 1 also gives you 0 and you're dividing by 0, which also can't happen. So both these things can't happen, though it's not very relevant. Uh, we can cross multiply here. Uh, and we can look at this quadratic here. Unfortunately, it's not a nice one. Um, you might recognize that this is the quadratic that solves into the golden ratio. If you don't, just complete the square for a little bit and you eventually work out that, yeah, you get this answer here. And this is what I missed, right? It's asking us how many um, solutions does this have, essentially, in the range minus 90 to 90. Now, I said, well, look at the picture of the tan graph. The tan graph from minus 90 to 90 goes up and then up again. So there's going to be whatever positive number half plus root 5 over 2 is, there's going to be one solution because 90 goes up to infinity, so there's definitely going to be a solution. And then of course when you have the negative there's also going to be a solution. So I said there are two, but you need to remember this rule here. And if we go full engineer for a second, root 5 we can just pretend is a sort of in the low twos, so divide that by 2 and that's in the low ones. Half plus that is about maybe 1.7, and a half minus that is maybe about minus 0, sorry, 1.2 and minus 0 0.7 is what I meant to say. Th those are my estimates if you just say this is like 2.1 or 2.2 or something. Um, and the problem is, remember r had to be between these two values, but if, if tan x equals uh, minus 0 0.7, 1 over tan x, 1 over 0.7 is bigger than 1 or less than minus 1. And so you're not in this range. So actually you can't have this solution. You can have this because 1 divided by 1.2 is less than 1. Um, so there, there is only one solution here. It's when tan x equals 1.2, which you can find a solution for in this bound. Again, if you draw the graph and, pit and, 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 and you can find that. You don't need to know where that solution is, but there is just one of them. I said two originally because I didn't consider this. Um, Jay, uh, so quite an interesting question. Let's get our head around what I was asking. You've got a square side length 2, and you're going to put a circle in it at radius r. And AR is the area that is inside the circle but outside the square. So currently there's no AR because there's no area inside the circle outside the square. BR is the region inside the square outside the circle. So all of this is BR in, in this case here. If you draw another example where the circle is slightly bigger, you can see both ARs and BRs because BR is going to be the sum of all of these little bits out here. Um, these four bits inside the square outside the circle and AR is going to be the sum of these curved bits inside the circle outside the square and, and, and apparently you're going to graph the function of adding up these two things together and see what it looks like for different R. This seems very complicated but let's just break it down. Look at all these functions, they all start at 4. Can we verify when R is 0, so when R is 0 and you bring the circle all the way down into a dot what is AR plus BR? Well, BR is just going to be 4, right? Because you've got the area of this square and then nothing in the middle. So it's just going to be 4. And AR is going to be 0 because there's going to be no area outside the, inside the circle, outside the square. So you're going to get to 4. So all these graphs start at the right place. Now, what happens if you just make the circle a bit bigger? What happens to AR plus BR? Well, like I can see here, if the circle gets a bit bigger, BR gets smaller because you're taking up space with this circle. But AR doesn't increase at all, because you don't have AR until the circle gets to like this size. So what's going to happen to the sum of these two things is it's going to go down as soon as the radius starts increasing. So we can cancel out this graph. It's clearly not that. The graph does go down from 4 immediately. Now we look at these four graphs and think, OK, how can I distinguish between these things? Well, these two, when R is 2, are about the same as where they were at the start. And these two, when r is 2, is much higher. 
So let's draw the case when r is 2. So here's the case where r is 2. So r is 2 means I need to draw a radius circle that's about the same length as this. And ask ourselves, what's ar plus br? Well, there's no br. There's no space inside the square that's outside the circle. ar is this. But I can just work out ar in this case. It's just going to be pi times 2 squared minus 2 times 2 to work out the area of this bit around here. And again, go full engineer for a second. Pi is 3. 4 times 3 is 12. Minus 4 is about 8. So when r is 2, you get about 8. So it's not these two graphs. It's going to be one of these two. And again, look at these two graphs. What's the key defining feature that's different about them? Well, this graph has a, has a place where the thing is 0, and this doesn't. So let's logically think this through. Can AR plus BR ever be 0? Well, AR and BR are both representing areas, and areas are always positive. So for this to be the case, you can't be cancelling each other out with one negative, one positive. They'd both have to just equal exactly 0 for this to work. But even if you draw a case like this, you can see when you, when you draw the circle about this size, you're never going to have a time when BR and AR are both 0 at the same time. Like, that's just going to be impossible. And again, you're not counting negative area here, so there's no cancelling possible. So this just is not possible to do. And so by deduction, this must be the answer here. Um, I think that's every question, though I can't quite remember. It is, cool. That's every question on the paper. Well, that's the first 10 questions. Um, the longer questions would follow, but I'm not doing those in this video. Um, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.